All right, so you know we got a busy day, lots yeah, of good we, talks. Yeah, we want to stay on schedule. We're very excited about. So this opening talk with Steve and I is really kind of an overview to what your whistle, like everything we're going to talk about is very, you know, kind of quick overview, just to get you excited about what's going on. But don't worry, you know, like this isn't the only time you're going to be getting this information. A lot of the other speakers are going to kind of drill down on these topics. So we kind of sat down and thought, you know, what are the coolest things that are happening in type 1 diabetes? And we're going to, we're going to go over those. So yeah, we, we, we wrote down all the things that kind of happened since 2019. And oh my God. And, and Jeremy's right. We're going we're gonna to get into details the rest of the conference. So we're going to give you an overview of uh, the new world of type 1 diabetes. Yeah. Go for it. So, you know, just starting again, you know, where are my type 1s at? So let's do this one more time. Raise your hand if you have type 1 diabetes, which is just, I it just, always it, it love it. It feels so good. Yeah. The people that don't raise their hand are feeling weird. You know, that's, that's great. Hey, how, how many of you folks are here to support someone with type 1, but you don't have type 1 yourself? Yeah, and I, I, and I promised myself I would not say if you're not a type one, you're a loser. But no, you're, you guys are the type three support people, which are so important. Well, I just read on the news today that type one is actually highly contagious. So if, if, you, if you don't have it, maybe by the end of the weekend. So. Um, but you know, the legends, where are the legends in the room? The 25 years and over, so yeah, that's me too. And you know, this next slide is that, you know, we really need you legends to kind of teach us your ways, especially to the newbies um, that God help them are still using alcohol wipes. <laughs> um, you know, they're wiping down every injection site and every time they prick their finger. But we know that those go away pretty quickly. And they change like, their lancets every time. <laughs> so then, um, you know, now we're injecting through our shirts. And, you know, so it's good to show people, like, the, you know, the things that you can kind of get away with, you know, <laughs> being a, a legend. You know, how to MacGyver your Omnipod and suck insulin out of it. You know, all these things that they don't kind of teach you. I bet there's people that are wearing a sensor for, like, 90 days in here. So... How to jury rig it to, to you, work longer. You and pop it out with your credit card, you put it back in, you put it in the microwave for two hours mm -hmm. on high. <laughs> and then you legends probably don't know what this thing is. This is a sharps container um, <laughs> where you're supposed to put your needles and things when you're done with it, but you probably use, you know, a Tide thing now or whatever you use. And then, yeah, we probably forgot, what is this? This is a Lancet. I don't remember changing one this decade, um, you know, it's not a good manufacturing kind of like thing that they make these last, you well, know, How much do you use? Them? I actually don't check my fingers like that much anymore. So these are completely out. So anyways, please learn from each other. That's kind of the point of this slide that the conversations that are, that happen here, obviously hope you learn from, but you'll learn just as much, if not more from the people just, you know, kind of eating and hanging out and stuff like that. So. We're going to talk a little bit kind of about basic information of type 1 diabetes first. So um, it's always important to say that most type 1s are the only one in their family with type 1 diabetes. So I'm the only one in my family, except for my brother Steve here. Um, <laughs> Steve's the only Blood one in brother. my family. So I got this black sheep, but I got type 1 diabetes on here because, um, I mean, look, he's got this earring and these like spiked, you know, things. It looks pretty cool. So that's common though, you know, people always say that, you know, gosh, I'm the unlucky one, you know, whatever. There was this kind of old myth that it would skip a generation, that's not true. Uh, most people happen to be the only one in their family with Yeah, it turns out 80% of us folks with type one do not have a family history. And that's really important when Justin Gregory speaks to you all tomorrow about uh, T-Zeal and screening. So that's where you can do your part in uh, getting these folks identified and get, offering them a potential good treatment. Mm -hmm. So um, we're all the lucky ones, the cool black sheeps here. Now, the other thing that comes up a lot is that you can get type 1 at any age. So we always talk about it as, you know, just, you know, like it's, it's only kids getting this disease. Steve had a patient, I think it was 80-something diagnosed. 88, yeah. 88 yes. when she was diagnosed. Um, so it's something else that people, like, as, there's a lot of people that kind of gravitate towards TCOID that got it later in life because maybe they didn't feel like, you know, they had anywhere that they kind of belong because... Pediatricians do a really good job of taking care of it, but when you're diagnosed as an adult, it's like, where do I go? People are misdiagnosed as type 2, they're started on medications that don't work, and then finally they find their way to getting the right diagnosis. So if you're diagnosed as an adult, and I bet there's a lot of you here, who was diagnosed when they were over 18? Yeah, actually most of you. 
And so that kind of proves the point. And I bet a lot of you had some, some frustration or anger when like with the diagnosis um, to get it, but you're here. So why do I have a pizza? Well, I like pizza, so <laughs> that's it. There's this place called Pizza Port, which is you know San Diego tradition, and that's what this is. So, and I just, it's easy to cut in half. So half people can get it when they're less than 18, half can get it over than 18. So any time in your life. Yeah, and that's, that's important to know because it, many doctors don't even know that. It's not, it's not just a childhood disease. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that when you get type one later in life, your pancreas, uh, your beta cells work a little bit better and may, may be destroyed a little slower. And that's the LADA that some of you had latent onset diabetes in adults. So it, it's, it, but we're all type ones, we're all blood brothers. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's the bad news first, that every like, talk about type one diabetes has to talk about like what's going on in the world. But then we're gonna switch to the good news, so don't worry. So. Only two out of 10 people in the US get their A1C down less than seven. So that's not that great, right? That means that 80% of the people don't get their, their blood sugars to go. And that doesn't mean that these people aren't working their butt off, taking you know, shots and, and, and measuring you know, glucose all the time. There's no disease like type one diabetes that requires like all that work. And when you do get it that low, at least in years past, if you're not on a hybrid closed loop, you got a ton of lows, dangerous lows. So, it's, it's not just that all us type ones don't follow the rules. It's a tough condition to yeah. control. And it's unlike anything else because like, you know, if you had pneumonia and it was out of control, you wouldn't blame yourself. When your blood sugars are high or low, like, you know, there, there's really something personal about type one diabetes that you, you take it on like, I'm a failure, you know, versus like, there's a lot of people struggling with this because it's hard to keep your blood sugars under control. Steve and I also struggle with this a lot. I blame people who cough in my face when I get pneumonia. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> And then um, I'm going to talk about this. I have a weight management talk coming up, but actually two out of three type ones are either overweight or obese. So we think about, you know, kids running around and skinny, you know, type ones, but this is an issue that we, you know, we actually have a whole talk dedicated to this. There's an official definition of overweightness and Jeremy will go through that. And it's been a, an issue. When you look at the weight of people with type one over time, it's going up. And I just think it's our society. It's, uh, you know, just getting older. There's a lot of reasons for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we still have bad lows. One out of 20 people will go to the ER or the hospital with a bad low each year and about the same rate for diabetic ketoacidosis. So these, this is kind of the bad news that it's, it's a tough disease to control. We, we literally deal with the highs and the lows. Um, so this is kind of what we're up against. Um, again, a great community here, but this is kind of like what we're, we're dealing with. So what this looks like in real time, I think when you go to, you know, when you're frustrated with diabetes, you're probably not saying like, well, my A1C isn't like exactly where you want. This is what's going on. So this is me just the other day and I'm going along. It says Jeremy Bolus is for breakfast. I don't remember exactly what I ate, um, but then my blood sugars go high. You get mad, you do what we call rage bolus, you know, take a bunch more insulin than you should, or you trick your pump and tell it, you know, you're eating more carbs or whatever it is. And then you go low and maybe you don't even go that low, but you stuff your face or eat more than you should because you need it, right? Um, and then your blood sugars blast off and you repeat. And that is type one diabetes in a nutshell. That's the frustration of like the going up and going down. And even these little oscillations aren't that much, but even those require like all the mental effort and the thinking, did I get my, my dose right? Did I eat too much? Did I take it too time? early? Mm -hmm. You know, um, Dr. Bader, Schaefer and I are gonna give a lecture Sunday morning and we're gonna let you be the endos. We're gonna go through about five or six cases and we're gonna emphasize the postprandial spike. We call it the shark attack. And uh, it's probably one of the most hardest thing to deal with as someone with type one. For sure. All right, so the struggle is real. So if you're out there saying, you know, like this disease can, can really suck sometimes, it absolutely does. And I think that you should be able to admit that and that, you know, we all have our, our failures and we're, we're dealing with some tough stuff. But cheer up, here's some good news. And I, I Googled, <laughs> Googled good news and this came up. I don't know, these guys look, I don't know what, I have a lot of questions actually. Like, <laughs> like uh, I have a question. Yeah. If this monitor is right there, why do you keep looking? I up? didn't know it was here until just now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did these guys know each other? Like, or <laughs> did they just meet? But they're having a good time. So here's, um, here's some of the good news. So basically what's hot in type one diabetes? What can we use? What, what's um, on our side now to kind of combat um, you know, these blood sugars? And I think we have like four different categories or so just to go through. But the first thing we wanna talk about is technology. 
that, you know, I'm sure most of you are on continuous glucose monitors or these hybrid closed loop pumps, but they keep evolving in a good way. It's like every day there's a new system, like, you know, for us to keep up with. Yeah, we got five hybrid closed loop systems now. They're all a little different. You know, their algorithms are different. The form factor is different. And it's, I think it's important to have choices. Yeah. And they're all very, very good. They go on the concept of automatic insulin delivery. So, you know, before talking about where we're at now, I made this sophisticated chart, and you don't have to take my word for it. It's, it says sophisticated chart at the top. Um, so this is changes to my diabetes regimen over time. I was diagnosed in 94, 95 about that. And the point here is that like for the first 10 years or so, like, you know, things didn't really change. I have the next slide of actually what I was using. But then things have just like blown up, like I said, and you really like have to keep on top of it because it's very often you'll go to your provider and say, hey, like, you know, I want to try X, Y or Z and they've never heard of it. And it's not that they're a bad physician or whatever. It's just that things are changing quickly. And that's why good news for or it's good for all of you to be here and educating yourself to really advocate for, hey, I heard about this or, or whatever. And really what we want is two things. We want better diabetes control and we want to work less hard for it. And that's what we want diabetes or this technology to do is just make my blood sugars good and make me just live like without thinking about it. Basically. Yeah. And, and saying that, you know, the, the amount of advances have been exponential the last five years, even just crazy. And for some of you on multiple daily injections, uh, more power to you, as long as you've got your CGM and your A1C is good, everybody's different. And don't, don't feel like, you know, you're not on the hypercles loop, you know, you're a bad person. Don't be ashamed of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's everyone uses the regimen that works for them. So to know exactly my regimen. So when I was in the hospital, they sent me home with this thing. It's called the one touch basic. <laughs> and I always joke that even it was basic. They're like, <laughs> they're like this thing kind of sucks. Like, what should we call it? Like, I don't know, basic. Like, um, if you guys remember this guy, so it took 45 seconds to get a reading, big drop of blood. Um, and usually that reading after 45 seconds was error. And you had to like <laughs> take this thing off like an old like uh, computer mouse and clean it out. Um, so 45 seconds, not the end of the world, right? But when you're a 15 year old kid in high school trying to do this like under your desk or whatever, real pain in the butt, Steve's biting his tongue, but he's like, boo hoo, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he had to do his urine tests, you know, so. Um, you know, that's the thing that the other point I always make that like with the legends and the newbies, like, you know, it's just, it's like so much changes throughout time, you know, and like the newbies are talking about, yeah, my CGM failed. And the legends are just like, oh my God, give me a break. You know, <laughs> uh, we never had CGM, things like that. Complaining about the two hour warm up. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> so that was 94 and then two years go by and I get the one touch basic two, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the marketing people here were just like blowing it out of the water. And this had a, <laughs> a memory function on it. And the best thing about the memory function was, you know, you could sit in your endocrinologist's office and quickly go through the memory and you had to write down in the book, like what all your numbers were. And then of course they would say, this is all in the same pen. And I can tell that this is written backwards. <laughs> um, but like, I mean, who, like, do you really have to like write these things down? It was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, that's all we had. Yeah. So then like 10 years go by. And now I don't even know what these things are called, but things are smaller. Um, they're a little less blood, a little quicker. What bothers me in these commercials, the number's always 104, 102, <laughs> you know? It's like having, you know, that's your joke, that why can't it be like a 300 or something? You're, you're <laughs> what? Yeah. You know what, that, that is it's so true. Um, and then to go through this quickly, I had the Dexcom 7 Plus, the first CGM I had in 2010. And then it, then it started kind of picking up between 2012 and 2015, the four and the platinum and all that. Um, then the G6 and the G7. I've used the Eversense implantable as a sensor that we can talk about. So you guys have probably have been on a similar trajectory where things are just changing quickly. And with each of these iterations, they're getting better, particularly going to the G6 when we didn't have to do finger sticks. You know, so I always tell the story when we had a, had a patient in the hospital not that long ago, diagnosed with type 1 got them a, a Dexcom in the hospital. And I was like, this person might never really test their blood sugar, you know? So it was nice to witness like the death of, you know, this like this time period. Yeah, and it's so nice that, you know, in our hospital, we're pretty up to snuff on things and everybody gets a CGM in the first 24 hours. And this is your picture. I know, this is my picture. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is my urine, my Sheffield urine test kit. 
when, when I was uh, first diagnosed, you know, 10 drops water, five drops urine, the little blue pills are to measure glucose, the white ones to measure acetate. All you put in your log book is either plus one, plus two, plus three, or plus four. You held it up to a color chart. The tube turned a thousand degrees. How many of you folks used that? Thing? Look at that. Oh, look at these legends out here. But, um, you know, we've come a long way. And you know, this really wasn't that long ago. And then, of course, the next step was urine test strips. Uh, and you can just pee on a stick. And I don't know how you women did it, but for guys, it was pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the one slide that Steve asked that he could put in. Like, his very <laughs> I'm glad he did. Um, and obviously, here we are today. So if you guys haven't heard about these systems, you know, this is a great place to, to learn about them. We have breakout sessions today specifically talking about all these different systems. And then in the healthcare booth, all these people are represented. Um, so we have the Omnipod 5, the Tandem Control IQ, and then the Islet, which is kind of the newest um, kit on the block. Um, a couple people here at the conference have been using that. So these systems are fantastic. We call them hybrid closed loop, meaning they start to automate some insulin delivery. They don't do it all, you know, it's not like a set it and forget it thing. We don't have to bolus, not, you know, really yet. So we're, we're, we're getting there. And these systems have been really, really helpful. And here's another one called Loop. Anybody looping? Probably a bunch of loopers. This is a... Not an FDA approved thing, but you can kind of hack your phone if you want to talk about in the breakout sessions about that, how to do that. This is a system that Steve's been using. Basically with the Omnipod, it does, you know, essentially what the Omnipod 5 does in a little bit of a different way. So if you're like seeing these pictures for the first time, like yeah. what are these systems? Yeah. You absolutely need to educate yourself. If you're already on one of them, learning tips and tricks of the different modes that you can use and settings and things like that to get the most out of these because they, they really can be helpful. And where they're really the most helpful is overnight. They help almost eliminate your lows, almost. You know what, uh, some of you have not looked at the schedule, may have not looked at the schedule yet, but we have two workshops. The first one is hybrid closed loop for people who, have, who are not on them but interested. So if, and then the second one is more advanced. So make sure you go to the session that is most appropriate for you. So if you guys aren't familiar with looking at these, this is a Dexcom download. And the point I'm trying to make is that this is somebody's average blood sugar from midnight to midnight. And these gray bars are how much variation they have at that time. And you can see that on these systems, they kind of do whatever they need to do overnight. So when people are waking up, they're in range and consistently in range. And we all know when you wake up at you know, 110, 120, it's just gonna be a much better day than waking up at 300. And then guess what? You know, we're back in control and everything goes to hell again. But, um, <laughs> you know, these systems can, can really, really be helpful. It's always gonna, it's just the, which is the pointer? Yeah, just for you guys, you know, Jeremy's saying, going to bed really high. And this just overnight, when we're not screwing up our own diabetes, you come down, wake up with a great number, standard deviation, variability is minimal. And, yeah, and then the rest of the day is up to you. But if you look at these numbers up here, they're, they're not bad. Mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're not some of the best ones I've seen. But think about that and look how little low this person, these, this person yeah. has. So. so something to consider for sure. This technology has been a huge breakthrough and it keeps getting better. Like it makes said. our clinic at UCSD so much easier. Someone comes in these systems, everything's perfect. And I, I pretty much keep a list of what their favorite Peloton instructor is, because there's nothing else to talk about. <laughs> I, I write it in the notes, and then I come back and say, how's uh, Cody Rigsby doing? You know, and they, oh, you remember. <laughs> you know? All right, so definitely knowing about technology. New insulins, we can go through this a little bit faster. So um, for those not on um, pumps, and again, nothing wrong with that. Um, there are two newer basal insulins called Traceba and Tugeo. So if you take a basal insulin, probably Lantus, you should really think about getting on one of these because yeah. they're better basal insulins. They're more consistent. They have less hypoglycemia. So definitely ask your doctor, your, per, your healthcare provider about these because they've been around for a while. So this isn't like going to be a tough thing to get covered. Um, also, there's two new rapid acting insulins and the names of these, it's always fun. So we got Fiasp and Lumjev. 
And these are basically like the newer versions of Novolog and Humalog, respectively. They work a little bit faster, and I really do mean like a little bit. So you might not have quite as high of a spike after eating. Um, so, and you can put them in vials and put them in pumps. So it's something also to try. Yep. Sometimes people come back and say, you know, I noticed no difference, but other times people say like, it makes actually a big difference. Yeah, it gets out of your system a little, a little faster too. So yeah, these are all incremental benefits with fast acting, but I would just want to emphasize the, these two J-O and Traceba, they are significantly better than Lantus or Levomir. Yeah. Significantly. So you need to learn about that more today from other speakers. Yeah, I think I'm doing a breakout session on this too. That's right, he's doing it on the session, so. And inhaled insulin, Afreza, just a real game changer. So when you talk to people about Afreza, they either love it and use it all the time or have never heard about it. You know, like there's an inhaled insulin, what's that about? So I'm gonna do a whole session again on this. The, the, the beauty of a Frezza is it's inhaled, you know, but we're used to doing injections, so that's not that In California, deal. we're used to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it works like almost immediately. So nothing comes close to how quickly a Frezza works in bringing your blood sugars down, um, in, in kind of combating high carb meals. So if it's something that you don't know about, um, it's an actually really useful tool that you can use for all your meals. You can use it on top of pumps. Um, I'll do a whole session on that. It helps with that situation of rising after eating. Yeah. And then glucagon. You know, I think we kind of forget about it, that we've had that old red suitcase glucagon forever. <laughs> that if you guys, like, ever need to use it, it's usually, like, in, like, a bad situation. You have to, like, look at the instructions because there's a vial with powder in there, and you have to, like, mix it up. And it's actually a problem because you need to use this in emergencies. So everybody here should have a prescription for glucagon. And the two new ones are this one called, again, these names, Baxemi, which is a nasal glucagon. So God forbid Steve passed out. I could, you know, shoot this into his nose. No, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I don't when he's it. sleeping just to mess with him. But um, so you don't have to like breathe it in or anything like that. It can go right in the nose. The Gvoke is, is pre-mixed. Um, you can actually do it through your, your clothes or whatever. You don't see the needle, you just push it down. So it's a, like these are much more effective and efficient ways to get people glucagon um, in the event that you need it. And you actually, um, these are for emergencies, but you can give yourself glucagon. If you're in a situation where you're having a bad low and you're eating and you're not recovering, you kill yourself. Yeah, it's just amazing. It, it, it's, it's like an EpiPen. You pull off the tip, spring loaded, it's done. And when you're having, when your loved ones, or you're, you're having a bad low, it makes a huge difference. It has an expiration of two years, too. I think I'd, last time I demoed my old glucagon kit, it was like 2004 expired. <laughs> so again, some other sessions we're gonna do on this, but what about other medications for people with type one beyond insulin to control our blood sugars? Um, and why do I have pictures of all these people? Anybody know? Um, it's because they're all taking Ozempic. Um, and everybody in... Um, Everybody in Hollywood is on this, you know, kind of like wonder medication to help people lose weight. Um, but there's a lot of evidence now that maybe people with type 1 can use this, especially if people are overweight, which I already mentioned is a very common problem. Um, so looking beyond insulin is another big wave of like research. We're always going to need insulin and God bless it. But using other things like Ozempic and other like pills that I'll talk, you know, a lot about. Justin Gregory is doing a whole session on this of, you know, thinking beyond insulin to help us lose weight, to help us control our blood sugars with heart disease, all these kinds of things. I'm sick and tired of the type twos getting all the good stuff. I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, you know, Ozempic is the one on top and we go be the one on the bottom. Again, I'll talk more about this. So um, these are, Ozempic is for diabetes. We go via specifically for um, weight loss and obesity. Um, so people with type 1 can use these meds. And the drugs like the SGLT2 inhibitors like Jardiance Farziga, incredible. They help your diabetes control, not as much as these and not as much with the weight, but you know, congestive heart failure and especially slow down the progression of chronic kidney disease, which is pretty common in uh, anybody with diabetes. So then the last category is, of course, cure or these kind of cure-based approaches. You know, and I think, I don't know, we've... Like, kind of adopted this idea, well, we have the disease, we're gonna do the best we can about it, but where are we in terms of curing it? And this was actually a big year, the last year, or so we had our first ever approved drug called teplizumab um, to help delay the onset of type one. So not for us old timers that already have it, but for you know kids, our kids, our siblings that might be at risk for it of actually delaying the onset. 
and we're going to do a whole session about that. But that's the first time we've ever had a drug ever to do something about the disease itself. Everything else we just talked about was kind of blood sugars and the symptoms of the disease. But what about the immune disease itself and, and restoring the pancreas? Well, they've stuff? cured 300 laboratory models of type 1, never in a human. So it's, it is big news, the, fir the first disease-modifying drug. And I think it just opens the door for all kinds of therapy. And on this slide, this is important, Jeremy. Go through that. Yeah, a so this, there's a lot going on here. But basically what this is, is that this is the point where everybody was kind of diagnosed with type 1 diabetes right here. And now we're looking at all these stages of kind of what maybe you would call pre-diabetes when people are at risk. We can measure antibodies, again, in our, in our relatives to see if they're at risk to do something to try to prevent them from actually developing type 1. And then when people are actually diagnosed with type 1, they still have like 10 to 20% of their beta cells left. So some of you newbies that are you know, diagnosed in the last couple of years, you're probably still making some insulin, and that's worth holding on to, maintaining. So a lot of research in this area to help people kind of preserve what they have left. So again, this is preventing over here, preservation. And then for you know, Steve and I and you guys out there that have had it for a long time, we don't have any beta cells. So what's going on in terms of actually you know, uh, stem cell infusions and, and kind of restoring islet function? So anytime you read a news story about they've cured type 1 diabetes or there's research going on, blah, 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 it's helpful to think about it in these buckets. Are we talking about preventing it in people that don't have it? Are we talking about preserving it, people that are just diagnosed? Are we talking about some way of giving cells back to people just like us? Yeah, and there's people uh, from Vertex, which is a company that is now studying all kinds of ways to infuse viable beta cells that they can synthesize in a lab. They don't have to go to, you know, human beta cells. And it's amazing technology. And that's really for all of us who have way past the diagnosis stage. Yeah. That's very exciting. And they're working on ways to avoid the need for immunosuppressants. And some of their therapies do involve immunosuppressants, but at a lower level, much less side effects. So we actually have a research panel coming up today that I'm moderating. <coughs> My good friends Justin and Leslie, they're endocrinologists that do a lot of research. And then Aaron Kowalski, who's the CEO of JDRF, giving us an update on what's going on in all these, these, these different buckets, because there actually is a lot. So, you know, it used to be a couple years ago talking about re or, you know, research in type 1 was kind of like wah wah, but now like, there's a lot going on. <laughs> and, and, and Aaron, people just asking for money all day long. <laughs> all right, so listen up. So, if you were dozing off, this is probably one of the most important things that I'll say, and I actually said it yesterday, is that, um, you know, type 1s are living longer than people without diabetes, and that's worth a round of applause again. Um, <laughs> So I don't know about you guys, but when I was diagnosed, they said, well, you just lost 15 years off your life. And I was like, thanks, I'm 15 years old. That's cool. Um, <laughs> but it's not true anymore that, you know, like we are living longer and healthier because of things like this, educating yourself, taking care of not just your blood sugars, but, you know, your cholesterol and what you eat and exercise, all that stuff that you're doing, the work, it matters. So you will be around on this earth for a long time if you keep doing it. So with that in mind, I have to close it off by saying, <laughs> one of my famous quotes is that, well, sometimes you have to say F it. You know, with all that we do and everything we just talked about, the pumps and the sensors and everything that we wear, fantastic that like, this is all happening. But gosh, sometimes you just have to realize that things are just going to go a little bit sideways. So this was me the other day. I ate an acai bowl. I love these things. I don't even know what acai is. It's just like purple goop Sweet. from the heavens about 3,000 calories in here. Um, and, you know, then, you know, I kind of had some pizza and a beer. And uh, my blood sugar, of course, went up like 252. And I was like, well, that's a bummer. But I said, F it. And then I had a donut. And um, so that's how that's done. <laughs> and um, so the point here is that you know, we're all doing our best. There is a ton going on in type 1 diabetes. Take advantage of all the things that you can use, to, like new technology, insulin, maybe other medications that we're going to talk a lot more about. But then I'll also embrace that you're working really hard and this disease can be tough sometimes. Yeah, and you know, use this weekend to really get up to snuff. And I should also remind everyone that, you know, both of our controls is good now, thanks to technology. And you're not going to get complications when your blood sugar is high for days, weeks even, and sometimes months, you know, it takes years and years. So, you know, if, if you bounce up here and there, don't, don't beat yourself up. Mm -hmm.
let's go get some donuts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're done. Okay, we'll see right. you guys a little bit later.